series of for the series today and that speaking to Professor Sam Bass from the University of California, San Diego, who will be speaking about algorithmic randomness by probabilistic algorithms. Right. Stand back here. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, thank the conference for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I was thinking this morning that this was an appropriate talk to give at this conference. I wasn't sure why, because Sergi hasn't worked in this kind of thing. But it's a new topic for me. I, I feel like somehow Sergi's always gave, giving me the impression he's challenging us to do new things. And now I, since, uh, now I saw Dexter's photo uh, yesterday, I know he's definitely challenging us. <laughs> so if any of you saw that, so that's good. It's uh, a usual challenge setting in all this, of course. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, I, this is joint work with Mia Minas, by the way. Oh, everything new I say is, and let me figure out how to work this. So I want to talk about algorithmic randomness and a, a new approach to it. Um, so algorithmic randomness is a way of characterizing uh, random sequences of zeros and ones. So these are, we can think of them as reals if you wish, but they're just an in, infinite sequence of zeros and ones. And the intuition of what something it means for something to be random is that it should, in the algorithmic setting, I should say, is that it should look random to computable processes, right? So one particular x maybe by itself isn't random, but you can't get structure out of it in a way that, in a at least computable way. There's three classic ways of doing this, going back to the 60s and early 70s. Um, there's incompressibility based on Kolmogorov complexity uh, due to due to um, a Smart Muff, which is characterized in terms of you can't uh, more succinctly describe any finite portion of x than the length of that portion itself, modulo some constants. Um, the other, the second thing on the list there is that a, a random set, where's my button, is something that avoids effective measure zero sets. So an effective measure zero set is something that can be recognized by a computable process. And the unpredictability, the first one on the list there is the one I want to concentrate in this talk, there's no effective betting strategy which can succeed in earning lots of money by betting on the bits of x. So I'll talk about this more in just a moment, but the mental picture is you have a, an infinite sequence of zeros and ones coming at you, and before each one appears, you bet some money. Is it going to be zero or one? And you want to get rich off this process. And if you can get rich, it's not random, right? You've seen the process. Okay, and if you can't get rich, well, maybe it was random. If nobody can get rich, then it is random. Oh, wait, wrong. <laughs> so, okay, so let's talk about uh, betting strategies here because this is the one I want to concentrate on. Um, so here we have a betting strategy A is uh, looking at uh, infinite sequence X of zeros and ones. A is allowed to see the bits, the, the ith bit of X in order. So first sees the zeroth bit, then the first bit, then the second bit, and so on. Before seeing the bit, it, decide, bit, it decides to bet some amount on whether that bit is a zero or one. And the winnings of A are given by a martingale D. And the martingale D has the property that the A starts off with some non-zero amount of money. D of the empty string is, is uh, not zero. And then if A has already seen bits as coded by the string sigma, and it now sees either sigma zero or sigma one, meaning the next bit is either a zero or a one, then its expected capital after the next bit is equal to its capital at the current position. So in other words, the average of d sigma zero and d sigma one is just d sigma. So d is defining the capital function. That means the money, capital means the money that the strategy A has won by this point. Okay, and A succeeds against x if the limit as n tends to infinity of d of looking at the bets on the capital function on the first n bits of x is, is infinite. Okay. Uh, this is a little bit different than the standard definition. The usual definition uses the limb soup. But you can, con in most cases, you can convert limb soup to limb. So I'm going to just work with the limb version for this talk here. Okay. Uh, formally, the bets made by A are specified by a stake function q of sigma. So sigma means the bits that have been 
been seen so far. So sigma is an element of a zero, one star. It's a finite string of zeros and ones. And those are the bits of x that have already been seen. Uh, a using sigma picks a q value between zero and two. And that's the amount q minus one times c uh, that the next bit is a, a zero. And so this means that uh, the, after the next bit, the capital C that uh, A currently has becomes either C plus the amount of the bet, which is Q times C if the next bit is, is zero, or minus the amount of the bet, bet to minus Q times C. So a, bet of, a Q equals two means a uh, all or nothing bet that the next bit is a zero. Q equals zero is an all or nothing bet that the next bit is a one, and you can use intermediate values, or you can even bet Q equals one means you decide not to bet any money at all at this stage. Okay, good. So, uh, does that make sense? Feel free to stop me with questions, by the way, so it's okay. Um, here we go. So, here comes some of the classic definitions then. Uh, a string X of zeros and ones is computable random, if for every computable martingale, that means every martingale given by a total computable function, uh, the limit of n, of n tending to infinity of d of the first n bits of x is not infinite, so there's some finite bound on how much money A can accumulate. It's, uh, similarly, it's partial computable random if every partial computable martingale, this means every martingale that's partial computable um, has this property. And in this case, the, uh, you can require without loss of generality that the martingale actually outputs a rational value for Q or that it outputs an ever a, or being computable as a real value function also is equivalent to this. Something is martin look random, ML random, if for every CE martingale D, the set, this property holds, the limit N of D of X restricted by N is not in, in, infinite. Uh, so what is a CE martingale? This means the function is a CE function. And what this means is that if the function value f of x is alpha, there is a procedure which enumerates the rationals less than alpha. So sometimes it's called left CE. It's enumerating uh, values to the left of the output value alpha. Okay. So again, in each case, these can be, uh, the limbs can be replaced by limb soup, and the definition would be unchanged. Okay, so which would one think is the most natural of these definitions? Uh, I mean, I think as a naive person seeing for the first time, I would have probably thought computable random is the most natural definition for random because you have a computable process, it's guaranteed to always uh, compute something and place a bet, right? Uh, that's actually maybe not the consensus in the field. Generally, I would say Martin Luff random is the thing viewed as the central notion of randomness. Uh, for some good reasons, but we'll, we'll talk about those. Um, in the first case, it outputs a rational number and then computes a number. It can, it's equivalent whether you define it to output a rational number or whether you out define it so that you, it's computable in the sense of for any input sigma and any epsilon greater than zero, it outputs a rational within epsilon of the correct value, yes. So you can show the two definitions are equivalent in terms of what's random. Okay, and now as I've said, these Topic, these uh, concepts have been around since the 70s, uh, but they've been very strongly studied, very studied in great depth in the last 10 or 15 years. There's a number of textbooks that have come out in the last seven or eight years on this, in fact, too. So it's now a very active area of research. What's a computably enumerable again? Computably enumerable means if f of x equals alpha, you have, a C, you have an enumeration of the rationals less than alpha as a function of x. <coughs> So you, so you can choose your rational, or could be a, it could be a real number. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So alpha could be a real number. Yeah, it could, it could, could be rational or real. But the point is, you can enumerate the values less than it, right? But you don't, you don't know the convergence. You don't have any guarantees of convergence. Uh, so you know it will converge, but you don't know where. Right. Okay. And actually, this is a since you're asking such great questions, let's go back a page. Here I said d of lambda is non-zero. For computable random and partial computable random, you can say d of the empty string, lambda is the empty string, is equal to one. For martin Luff random, you don't necessarily know what your initial capital is. You can only enumerate up towards it, in this sense. 
And that's actually an important technical part of the definition. If you knew, even for the C martingale, that D of the empty string was one, then that would revert back to computable or partial computable, random. So even your initial capital is an unknown thing for Martin Love Random. Okay, well, okay, so moving right along, here's the, the pictures of these three classes. There, by the way, probably literally 30 or 40 different notions of randomness out there, but these are three of the more important ones. Uh, there's at least five or six important ones. And, but we know that any, any real number that's Martin Luff random is partial computable random. Any partial computable random is computable random. The, these arrows don't reverse. Uh, these are due to the, some of the names down here. The fact that the arrows go down is immediate from the definition. Right, uh, Harvey. So this is a linear ordering of size three. Now these 40 things you talked about, are they linear the order? Um, I don't think they are exactly, no. They could, they could be. I, they could be. Some there's, there's a few that are. There are some definitely. Yeah. Some they don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, at any rate, let's talk about. So, Martin Luff Random is generally one of the core ones, partly for historical reasons. It was the, one of the first ones that came out. It was one of the first ones to have characterizations in all three of these paradigms I mentioned on the first slide. There's very nice, elegant ways of describing Martin Luff in all three of those settings. Um, it's very well behaved in a mathematical sense. It's got universal properties and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of nice reasons to study Martin Luff. And it's probably the strongest notion of algorithmic randomness that doesn't bring in explicitly things like the halting problem. It's also known as one random sometimes, um, but okay. Um, and there's two random and so on, which would be random relative to the halting problem, et cetera. But th this is one of the strongest notions of randomness that doesn't go past the decidability of the halting problem. Um, but there's Storr's critique already from the early 70s of what's wrong with Martin Luff random is ML randomness is defined in terms of computably enumerable objects rather than computable objects. And this notion of left CE is just basically unnatural. Right? Who would ever define some function like this? I and mean, what better is going to sit down and say, okay, I don't know how much money I have, but I can see my pile slowly growing up as I enumerate it. <laughs> and let me go ahead and start betting. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't really have the concreteness or the constructiveness, and that's the theme of the conference here, is we want something constructive for these randomness. So what I, the goal for this talk then is I'd like to give a more computable characterization of ML randomness. Okay. So, there we go. This is gonna be based on probabilistic strategies. And these are, uh, this is the central construction for the talk. Uh, it's, uh, so a, prob a probabilistic betting strategy A does the following at every step. It computes a probability value P, which can be a rational number, between zero and one, of course. It computes a stake value Q that it will use to bet if it places a bet. Then, with probability P, it does bet on the next bit of x. And with probability one minus p, it doesn't bet and it just waits. I said passes here on the slide, but this isn't the poker sense of pass where you pass and you then don't get to bet on this bit ever in the future. Here you, it's more of a wait. You get to bet on the same, you get a chance to bet on the same bit in the next step if you, if you wait in the current step. So. Uh, no, Q doesn't, well, they're both, they're both computed by the strategy. They're both total computable functions. So they're both algorithmically computed. It, you don't need the value, Q is ignored unless you actually do place the bet. Yeah. So it wouldn't make any difference whether you waited until after hearing where this event P occurs or not to, to uh, compute Q. These are on initial segments. So we've seen 17 bits so far. We say, okay, with probability one third, I'm gonna bet with stake value one and a half or something like that. And then somewhere magically you, you have a probability event occurs that either with one third you do bet or with probability two thirds you don't bet. But if you don't bet, the bit of X isn't revealed. It's still sitting there hidden and you get a chance to bet on it the next time. Okay. So basically let's do some notation here then. Uh, okay, sigma is a string of zeros and ones the bits of, bet, bits of x that have been seen so far and have been bet upon so far. Of course, as always, if you don't want to actually stake any money, you can just do a q equals one value, and so then it's like betting zero dollars, but that's permitted. 
And pi is the history of the betting versus waiting uh, so far. So pi is a string of Bs and Ws. Bs stands for the event where you bet, or strategy A bet, and W stands for the event where strategy A didn't bet and took a wait op op operation. The probabilistic strategy A then is just defined by two total computable rational value functions, P sub A and Q sub A, which are functions of the pi and sigma strings. So it's the functions of the bet weight decisions made so far and the bits of X seen so far. This, is, this can be important. So one thing that can happen is that with probability bigger than zero, A just waits forever. And this is actually an important feature that will come up in just a several sl few slides. Okay, so you know, A isn't required all the time to eventually bet. You could have some guy who just dithers there, oh, maybe I'll bet no wait. <laughs> maybe I'll bet no wait, <laughs> you know. So someone's little, you know, someone's at the casino and a little dubious about their ability to bet and just, just sits there all night and freezes, right? <laughs> okay, can happen. Uh, is permitted. Good. So, just get a little formal for just a moment. The capital at node pi, we think of a tree of bet weight moves. The capital node pi of this tree, after seeing string sigma, can be defined formally just by this. And this is just saying again what I did on the last slide. Initially, there's no better weight moves and the string, the no symbol seen and your, your initial capital is one always. If you do a weight, pi w means you were, you've already done some sequence of bets and weights, you do another weight and your capital doesn't change. And that should be a subscript A right there. Um, it's missing. On the other hand, if you bet pi b with, and you then see either a zero or you then see a one, then your capital is then multiplied either by the q sub a value or two minus the Q sub A value, just as on the earlier slide. The probability of reaching node pi when playing against sigma, initially you have pro probability one of starting the game. That's what nothing's happened so far. And then the probability of waiting, if you've already reached uh, node pi, the probability of waiting is then that probability of reaching that node pi times one minus P sub A of pi sigma. And the probability of betting is the same probability times just P sub A, pi sigma. If you fix the string X, uh, this P sub A then des defines a measure on the space of all possible bet weight, bet weight plays, uh, which we can think of the strings of infinite length of Bs and Ws. And the measure is just defined in terms of the probability. So the measure on any finite segment, this is the cone above pi, is just the probability P sub A when played on the input x. Obviously there's a different probability measure for each x, but if you have, because your probabilities of whether you bet or not depends on the uh, bits of x that have been seen so far. Okay. Okay, so enough formal stuff for the moment. Uh, well, a little more formal stuff. So here's our crucial second, well, second part of, of our definition. What does it mean for a probabilistic strategy to succeed? Right? You've got some player who's playing and they want to know how likely are they going to walk home after an infinite amount of time with an infinite amount of money. Right? So the outcome can be measured in two ways. Success can be defined either as success in expectation or success with probability one. Okay, there's other ways too, but these seem to be those natural ways. So strategy A is a successful P1 strategy for probability one against the string X if the set of, of paths pi of bet weight moves where the capital is unbounded or actually tends to infinity has measure one. So with probability one, you're going to end up with infinite capital in the limit. Strategy A is a EX strategy for expectation in the following sense. If you, you define uh, E, uh, EX sub A superscript X of N to be the expected capital that's available after N bets. Okay, and you want that expectation to be infinite as N tends to infinity. Now this is not conditioned on reaching, this is comes back to the earlier question, not conditioned on reaching the nth bet. It also includes the, the capital that you'd have if you didn't reach the nth bet in effect, right? Although we don't throw it in here. So formally, EX sub A superscript X of N, it's the 
sum over all pi's that make n bits, I'll come back to that in just a second, the probability of reaching that pi times the capital at that point. Okay, Rn is the set of, of strings pi that have made n bets, so pi sub, pi length of pi sub b means that it has n b's in it, so you made n bet moves, and it, all they have to end with a bet. So you think of, you're making a sequence of bets and after you've made your nth bet, you stop and look how much capital you have. You take the probability of reaching that node times the amount of capital you have, you sum all that up, and that's our definition of the expected capital after n bets. So the guy who has some probability of freezing up and never betting again, you know, it's going to, that's gonna hurt his expected capital. Okay, but it's not necessarily fatal, right? Maybe the probabilities where he doesn't freeze overwhelm that. So these are the two definitions of winning. And I guess the kind of analogy is that if you're an insurance company and you're placing bets on whether people's houses are gonna burn down, you're perfectly happy with the expected success, right? If you're insuring your own house, you might not be so happy with expected success and you really want, probably want success that your house will, <laughs> will get paid off if it burns down. Or if, you know, if I went and placed a large bet on some risky thing and lost it, I'd go home and tell my wife, oh, I just lost $1,000, but my expected return was $10,000. <laughs> She's got not gonna be very happy about it. <laughs> a few billion in the case. A few billion, yeah, billion would be better. I could have been Bill Gates' fault, but no. <laughs> I lost it all. <laughs> what? Sorry. Morgan Stanley. Morgan, oh, Morgan Stanley. Okay. Oh, yeah, Diamond, yes. <laughs> Yes, there you go. So if your insurance company, even, even expected isn't always quite good enough, I guess is the point. <laughs> but, okay. So we can now make definitions. A string X of zeros and ones is P1 random if there's no successful P1 strategy for X. It's EX random if there's no successful EX strategy for X. And sort of implicit in this is that this makes sense as a definition, it does. So I'm not gonna try to prove that. We can also require, now it comes back to the question, that the strategy must eventually bet. And we have two concepts that go with that. So we use the adjective weak to mean that let's, weak means the strategy is more constrained. It has to always place the next bet. So no matter what sigma of zeros and ones it's seen so far, it must eventually place another bet. And so that weak P1 uh, random means there's no computable prob probabilistic strategy which always bets with probability one, eventually, that's a successful P1 strategy for X. Weak EX strategy is defined the same for expectation. Um, locally weak means that it only needs to eventually bet on the particular input X that's being looked at. So to be locally weak against X means that for this X, it will eventually place unbounded number of bets, right? It never gets stuck on this particular in, in, input. Okay, so locally weak again means always bets on this particular input X. Weak means bets on any input eventually, but you know, of course it could be quite unboundedly wait time still. There's no bound on how long it waits. Okay, so remember the original characterizations, I can now state our first two theorems is that NO random is the same as EX random. We, uh, partial computable random is the same as P1 random. Okay, so in other words, being Martin Luff random is the same as being able to, uh, well, uh, well, let's say it the other way. Not being NL random is the same as being able to win against the string X in expectation. Not being partial computable random is the same as being able to win against the string X with probability one. Okay, and the other two theorems I wanted to state so far is the where weak and locally weak comes in. Uh, this has the interesting thing, you'll notice computable random was missing completely for before, but now weak P1 random is the same as weak EX random is the same as computable random. So if the strategy is constrained to always place another bit eventually against X, then whether you're doing P1 randomness or EX randomness, it's the same as computable randomness. Um, whoops, I think I said that wrong. If the strategy is constrained to always place a bet no matter what input it sees, no matter what the bits are, 
then we get computable random. If, however, it's locally weak, so it's constrained to always bet on this particular input x eventually, then locally weak ex random is the same as p1 random is the same as partial computable random. So there's something somewhat strange going on here in the sense of this reveals that there's something essential in ML random that, you know, this, this not knowing, in, in ML random we have the thing we maybe didn't know our initial capital was only enumerating up towards it, right? That's somehow analogous to the fact here that ML random seems to require somehow the fact that you don't know whether or not a bet is going to ever be placed. You don't know whether you're stuck with probability greater than zero of never betting or whether you're going to bet. That somehow is related to this. So I guess I remark this on the next page. So let me just say all this again. The crucial difference between computer randomness and partial computer randomness is a strategy may st stop betting with non-zero probability on inputs other than x. So going back to the previous page for just a flash, uh, that's because it's locally weak and weak, right? So that means the difference between locally weak and weak is whether what it does on inputs other than the current input x. So again, so. That means that that's the difference between computable and partial computable ran ran randomness in the setting. The crucial difference between ML random and either computable or partial computable random is basically you can think of it two different ways. The first way I stated it was in terms of expectation of success versus probability one of success. But the second way to thinking about it is the strategy ML has some, for ML ran randomness can tolerates or actually needs some unknown probability of never betting by just going and waiting forever. And that seems to be a crucial component to this. Okay. Uh, let me just, here's a uh, fresh off the drawing board theorem that uh, was proved last Friday, in fact. So, you know, the first to see it uh, is what about probability of success being alpha non-zero but not equal to one? So maybe you call this P alpha success, although I didn't use this on the slide. So the uh, theorem is that if you allow, cons consider strategies that are successful against X with some probability alpha, constant probability alpha greater than zero, if a sequence is partial computer random, if there's no locally weak probabilistic strategy which is successful against X with probability alpha, it's computer random if there's no weak probabilistic strategy which is successful against X with probability greater than alpha. So this is a bit of generalization and I sort of wanted to put in one proof for my talk so it's, I can't fit the whole proof into one slide but I'll fit the intuition for the proof into one slide. If you're given a betting, here's the proof the intuition. If you're given a betting strategy A that succeeds on X with some probability alpha that's non-zero. So first thing is, without loss of generality, there's a standard trick we can use that's called a slow but surely savings trick, which means that A never loses very much of its capital. And this is you know, the opposite maybe of what investment banks do nowadays. But the idea is, once you, you, can, you, can, you can assure that you never lose more than $2 of money you've earned. Basically, any time you basically divide your money up into two piles, there's the saved money and there's the, the mad money. <laughs> And whenever your mad money gets bigger than two, you take a dollar of your mad money and put it in the saved money. And if your earnings are gonna be unbounded, they'll still be unbounded in this setting. So, you know, if, you have, if you're ever gonna get infinite capital, you may as well start with, instead of your full capital, just start with the capital two, right? So this will, this will still get you to an inf infinite amount of money, even putting money into savings along the way. Okay, so. Okay, so maybe not such a good strategy for getting rich quick in the real world because we don't live forever, but it works fine in the setting of where you rerun forever. In the Hilbert Hotel setting, it works fine. In the Hilbert Hotel setting, this works fine, yes. <laughs> so, but now we've got this unknown number alpha, which uh, could be non-rational, may not even be computable, right? But we can bracket it by two rational numbers, Q1 and Q2, that are Q1's less than alpha, Q, Q2 is bigger, they're both close to Q1, and Q, they're both close to alpha. And this, we're gonna build a new probability one, P1 strategy B, that accepts the things that A accept. And B is gonna build these capital thresholds, C sub zero, C sub one, C sub two, that are gonna be large numbers in a way that I'm not gonna fully describe in this slide. Okay, but I can tell you what C zero is. 
C0 is large enough so that the probability that the capital ever exceeds C0 is less than Q2. Right? Because the probability that the capital is unbounded is, is alpha. That's less than Q2. So there's some fixed bound such that the capital can't exceed that fixed bound C0 with probability uh, greater than Q2. B then does the following. It's got some I value and it's got some C sub I value and it then acts like A choosing, P, choosing values P for the probability of betting and values Q for the amount to bet. Okay. And whenever it's doing this and there's a, the next bit of X isn't known, it, it goes ahead and bets just like A would. There's some cases, which I'm not going to describe here on the slide, where the next bit of X is known, then it can't bet, but okay, you can't have everything. Okay. At the same time, B dovetails over all other possible plays that A might be making, because A's got many plays it could be making, It's got because it has choices of whether to bet or wait. So B has made some particular choices about betting or waiting, but it can also simulate what A would have done with other choices of betting or waiting. When ever, when you do this, you're looking at the simulated plays of A and, and some fraction greater than Q1 of them get over the threshold capital Q sub I, then B says, oh, well look, we've gone a long ways and I see a Q sub one of the strategies of A are winning. And so B then says, okay, maybe I'm not doing things right. I'm gonna go jump to one of the things that A is doing. So my impression is something, the way I, so basically B jumps to one of the winning things and hopes that that really is a winning thing. It picks a new bigger value for CI plus one, increments I, and does the same thing again. So the intuition is, say alpha is 5%. The intuition is that 5% of the choices A could make are gonna win with unbounded capital. So I, I'm thinking of this, there's some super investors that make up 5% of the population. We can call them Warren. And, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we, we watch, everyone but betting, right? And so uh, once we see a lot of people winning a lot, we say, well, maybe those are the super investors. Some of them might not be, they might just be lucky, but I'm just gonna pick one of them at random. I have their algorithm, I have their history of bet weight moves, so let me go just do what they did. And if you do pick a super investor, then very good, you go up a lot. And if you don't pick up a super investor, well, you've got the slow but surely savings trick, so you don't lose very much by going along for ride on the non-super investor. And then you repeat, maybe you keep doing this over and over again because you may have picked a non-super investor, you don't want to stick with them. And you can arrange it so you got probability, say, better than 50% of picking a super investor each time. And so you make a lot of money. So that's the proof idea. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. So uh, that's the th theorems I wanted to present. Let me state a couple open problems. Uh, First of all, we definitely need to understand expectation randomness better. The current definition, going back to about the third or fourth slide, of the expectation randomness was you wait until B bets have been made, uh, sorry, N, N bets have been made, that's was N many Bs, and you look at the, you know, the expected amount of money capital that you'd have after those N bits. So you can think of this as a stopping criteria. You're saying, let's take snapshots of the play of the strategy A, and my snapshots are gonna be boundaries where A has just finished making N bit, bets, okay? And, but you could think of other boundaries. Instead of just taking these little snapshots right when A has made N bets, you could think of taking strategies after N moves or other more complicated sort of algorithms where you take bigger and bigger snapshots and take the expectation at each point. Uh, if you do this in the, in the sort of obvious general way, things go really wrong no string is random. You can win in the limb soup sense against every input x. Really counterintuitive. In fact, this was our first idea for the definition was to take these general sort of snapshots and then look at the limb soup of the expectation. And after a great deal of agony, we discovered, well, nothing is random in that case. You can win against everything. So now, so open question is, what about the limb definition? Uh, limb soup, the point with limb soup is your values can go up and down a lot. And so as long as the, the limb soup is big, then you, you win. So the question would be whether you, if you, what about if you go back to the way I defined it on the first slides and you say that the limit of the expected winnings should tend to infinity. So you don't oscillate up and down a lot. Uh, the other open problem is a based on one of the central open problems in algorithmic uh, information theory. 
there's this notion of Kamogorov Loveland randomness, which is defined by what are known as non monotonic betting sequences. So, non monotonic means that you don't have to bet on the bits of x in order. You don't have to bet on the zeroth bit, then the first bit, then the second bit. You can choose to bet on the seventeenth bit, and then the trillionth bit, and then come back and bet on the zeroth bit, jumping around as you wish, and you can decide that on the fly. So, uh, it's known that this so-called KL randomness lies between ML random and partial computable random, but it's open whether it's equal to either of them. So we do know that partial computable random is different than ML random. We don't know where KL random sits relative to those. And this has been an open problem now for at least five or six, maybe a little bit more years. And it's sort of gelled into the main open problem in the field. So uh, just to throw that out. And then the other open question, which I can now state, is what's the strength of the non-monotonic betting strategies under the P1 definition of success? Okay. So this defines a class of reals that lies between KL random and ML random, and is it equal to either of these? Okay. Uh, you notice I used the P1 de de definition of success. If you use the EX definition of success, you fall prey to the things I mentioned here about these dramatic and unexpected failures. If you want to win a limb soup version of expectation, then you can do that against every string, so that wouldn't be so good. Before you change slides, you said this was the, perhaps the most well-known open question in the field. In the group of the KL. Whether KL is equal to ML or equal to partial computable or. Well, you said, you know, what field did you mean? Of, you don't mean the whole of uh, intellectual activity. Um, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Maybe the whole of, the whole of the whole mathematics, whole probably not. The whole of mathematical logic, well, you know. Okay, but in the area of algorithmic information theory. What, what well, most people aren't doing the game theoretic approach to randomness here, but this is certainly a strong strand of algorithmic information theory, is what I mean by that. So, so maybe the biggest open question, algorithmic information theory. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, that'd be great. We'll, we'll give you a contributor talk later on. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, one's hope would be, I suppose, well, either one would like to resolve this problem, that would be the best. Or, you know, maybe you can show that it's equal to one of them or the other. Or so, anyway, uh, since uh, that was it, so thank you very much. Very <laughs> contemporary. <laughs>
the love to bed with fixed amounts. It's a better plus one manner. Then certainly to, to say that the sequence of random, if whatever strategy I use, and my expected value would be at the end zero, all of this is so I will agree. Yeah. Um. So let's see. Of course, the, just to make, just to say the very basics again. Of course, uh, one way you could keep your expected value is one by just always betting evenly. That's betting no, betting no dollars on the next bit. So you could always get expected value one, or you know, just never uh, bet. But but game. but expected gain. Expected gain. So there's several important things here. One is it is important that we're dealing with all rational numbers, you can, right. right? Because you can have infinitely small amount of money. Um, close to zero, you could lose a lot of money. If you were dealing with discrete values, you couldn't own less than a penny, for instance, you could fall off zero. There are There is research on people dealing with integer valued capital functions. So where people, you have to bid an in, in, in integer value of money, but then you get very different results. Should you say, look, the expectation should be zero, no matter what. I mean, it, it's the old result, but you cannot bet against a casino. Oh, but the point is, you have a particular input x, and you want to know, is it random? So suppose x was all zeros. So if you know this, you so can it's just... Random, so it's not random. Right, so you can bet on it, so it's not random. Right, but for random things, oh. This is a characterization for the randomness of x, right? Yeah, so if it's random, no, the point is, you if could keep really your... Random, you should have no effective strategy of getting non-zero gain. Yes, if you have a minimum amount for your bet, and you're taking a random walk because it's really random, yes, you would always hit zero, right? So, but here we don't have a minimum amount on the bet. And but see, very few things are uh, non-random, is the point, right? Most things are random. But you could still set it up with a slow but, save, slow but surely savings trick so that your capital never falls below, say, one half. That, that could be arranged. I think we are doing We may be talking about different things. But I just wanted to ask an historical question because I don't know. There has been attempts since the 30s to define random sequences following from Mises' collective idea. Right. And one is by Church, which is very similar to this, and the other is by a French mathematician, Bill, and so on. And they mentioned, they look, it, it looks very much like something like that. Yeah, um, I don't know this history as well as I probably should. I've seen it cited in some of the papers, but these earlier tests were various types of statistical tests. And basically, when you hit Martin Luff, this is where you said all computable tests are statistical tests, and that's where they get a really strong definition of, of randomness. Yeah. So in classical probability theory, there is the strong and the weak law of large numbers, which also <coughs> is a distinction between something happening in expectation eventually and something happening in time. Right. That's something I haven't thought about. That's a good idea, but I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good that's a good connection to think about. Yeah. So let's thank all the speakers.